All right, so this will be our typical Kahoot, uh, about 30 seconds per question. We'll have a chance to talk. Um, so feel free to either um, put something up in the chat. You can do it on the sticky board, or if you just want to pipe up and talk to me, that would be fine too. I am quite lonely, so you know any any additional chatting is, is welcome. Um, but let's get started here. You guys can just see the Kahoot window. You can't see the chat and other stuff, right? Okay, good. Just make sure sharing it effect appropriately. <clears throat> All right. Hopefully it does Kahoot correctly. All right, so which of the following medications do we think would be best suited for migraine prophylaxis? We do sumatriptan, dihydro or gotamine, or pranolol, or maybe a little bit of Percocet. What do we think? Very good. Yes. Um, the person who said Percocet is very nice. That was, that would be, uh, very generous to your patient, but it might not be the best stuff for them. As we learn about addiction later on, uh, we get into that. Um, so important to realize you know, when we're talking about like acute treatment of migraines versus the prophylaxis. So again, that's another thing you want to make sure you're um, differenti differentiating between when you're looking at your medications here. So propranolol makes sense. You do that as a preventative. If you use that for an acute attack, it would actually probably make it worse, if anything. So that'd be a bad idea. Um, and then the sumatriptan and DHE, those are going to be more for acute treatment, which I'm sure most of you probably know. Uh, and then like Percocet would be very rare instances where you'd use that. I think most providers would be pretty um, shy about using uh, a, something like an opioid for a migraine case. So, Doctor, what I have a quick question. For sure, you. what's up? Uh, with the propranolol, um, I know that can probably cause like bradycardia. Um, if someone com um, comes into the office and saying their heart rate was low, would we tell them to stop taking that for their migraine or only if they're symptomatic? So how... The reason I'm asking because I was taking propranolol mm -hmm. and um, for another reason, and my heart rate was in the 50s, mm -hmm. and I felt okay, but I, I, it was kind of weird because I know that's bradycardia. Yeah, um, right, and so, you know, sinus brady is not necessarily a sign of anything bad going on uh, necessarily, so, you know, and you'll find that too in a lot of, like, athletes and stuff. You'll find they'll have relatively low resting heart rates. Um, so my question would be, okay, are you symptomatic? Um, especially like, you know, upon exertion, are you able to kind of yeah, okay. do the things you normally want to do? If you find like you're getting winded really easily and, and just overall fatigue, then I'd probably stop it at that point. But, um, now if it was like in the forties, I'd probably be a little more concerned and maybe switch to something else. Um, but in the fifties, I think that's, that's probably fine. Thanks. Definitely shows you're maximally beta blocked at that point. So very good. <clears throat> okay. So moving on. Glad that that face is on in the first place. Most of my tests probably make you feel. Uh, okay, let's say a patient with no insurance and occasional GERD symptoms would most benefit from which agent? You want to do misoprostol, rebeprazole, calcium carbonate, or polyethylene glycol? Chat too. Very good, calcium carbonate. So why do we think that would be the correct option here? What, why do we think this is the best option? Anyone know? Lost my chat and bring it. It's an OTC, cheap and reliable. Very good. Um, <clears throat> that's a good answer for that for sure inexpensive it's it's occasional you guys absolutely got that down um just make sure i didn't miss anything um yeah so that would definitely be a good case there like you know and you can get it just from anywhere but um something like you know rebeprazole i would certainly um would be prescription only if you needed otc ppis they're certainly available they're just gonna be more expensive than something like uh tum so you could get like you know uh omeprazole and, you know things like that are, are available um any idea when you might want to use like side attack when you use misoprostol <clears throat>
they can't DC inset. Yeah, so that's going to be the main case there, right? So if you have someone who's on an inset and they can't uh, come off of that for whatever reason, or maybe, and we'll talk more about COX-2 selective inhibitors later on, um, when that's not going to be reasonable to switch them to, then something like misoprostol would, would certainly be reasonable. Yeah, and do not use it in pregnant patients. It is, uh, would, would potentially induce an abortion, um, which is not be ideal for those patients. Um, although you may use it occasionally for like an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, I've seen you use it in, in a rare, few rare cases there. Um, but yeah, so that would be the good case for that. Uh, obviously, Miralax would not do anything for GERD symptoms. That's going to be for uh, constipation. So, All right, moving on. Again, don't worry about interrupting me. It's totally fine. I got all, all day to talk to you guys. Uh, which of the following antiepileptics can cause pancreatitis and hepatotoxicity? Be clobazam, benztropine, valproic acid, or lorazepam. <clears throat> Very good, yeah. So um, valproic acid, you're going to see it used a lot, especially for things like bipolar disorder. You'll see it used for potential migraine prophylaxis like we discussed. Um, but certainly for um, uh, in terms of things to monitor for, definitely want to monitor for um, liver function, right? That's a big thing you're going to do at baseline and, and that follow-up. Um, you know, the pancreatitis thing is sort of a unique thing to valproic acid. So, it's, you know, it's like a good like board style question or like good pimping question if you're on rotation. So that's always a good thing to know. Um, and then um, with the other agents, they're not really known to, to cause that. And of course, benzotropine we wouldn't really use for uh, as an antiepileptic because you use that for things like Parkinson's disease, or we might use it to um, offset side effects from uh, things like uh, some of our antipsychotic drugs or like Reglan, for instance. Um, so that's when you'd uh, end up using that. Um, interestingly enough, uh, just as a little side tangent from a little clinical pearl, um, valproic acid also has a tendency to disrupt the uh, urea cycle in the liver. And that, when that happens, it has a tendency to increase uh, ammonia levels. And if you're not familiar with uh, hyperammonemia, um, it can cause some pretty significant altered mental status. And so I actually had this patient one time um, who was, um, had, you know, kind of a, a couple of different behavioral health issues, but one of which was uh, oppositional defiant disorder. And they were trying to manage that with a mood stabilizer. They're using valproic acid. Uh, this guy's a teenager, you know, probably like 15, 16 years old. And uh, basically at school, they found him to be, um, you know, having slurred speech and just not really with it, wasn't answering questions appropriately. And of course, you see a teenager acting like that, you assume like they're goofed up on some kind of, or hopped up on goofballs or something like that, right? So, you know, could it be alcohol? Could it be something else? Um, so anyway, so they brought him to the ER for medical clearance. And so they're looking at ethanol levels were negative. Um, urine drug screen was negative for everything. They couldn't really find a good reason for this. And so I was looking at the medication list and I noticed that he was on, on valproic acid. So I said, huh, um, well, let's check an ammonia level, right? And so providers didn't really have any other plan at that point. So I said, let's go ahead and check it. And sure enough, it comes back elevated, like very elevated. Um, and so we kind of had our smoking gun at that point. And so um, in order to, to treat that, we actually ended up giving the patient um, something called levocarnitine. Some of you probably heard of that before. It's a, you can find it as like a dietary supplement, um, but it's actually the the antidote for that. You can uh, they basically have a, a carnitine deficiency in the liver, and so we can replace that, and that helps them to process the ammonia. And then within a day or two, the patient's levels were back down to normal, and they were able to be discharged. Um, so kind of interesting with valproic acid, um, kind of a rare thing you may see, but we use it for lots of different things. So that's why it may come up occasionally. Um, uh, I, I only share the stories where I have a nice catch. I never give you guys the stories where I totally screw up, obviously. Uh, I, I'll tell you those too. <clears throat> it certainly happens. Okay, uh, which of the following is most appropriate for a four-year-old male to prevent constipation? Would we want to give him mag hydroxide, glycerin suppository, sodium phosphate enemas, or polyethylene glycol? Yeah, I always share the funny stories. All right. So um, key, key point here is, again, the prevention of constipation, right? So we're talking about like kind of like daily management. 
And so um, a lot of these other ones will certainly treat constipation that's kind of acutely going on. But if you went, if you did this for try to like for prevention, basically, you'd probably end up causing a lot of diarrhea to to occur there. Um, you know, so certainly for a four year old, I would not be too hesitant to use a sodium phosphate enema. They don't really, uh, it's really the infants that I worry about using those, those sodium phosphate enemas and causing electrolyte disturbances. But for a four year old, they should be able to tolerate it just fine. Um, you know, mag hydroxide we use occasionally. Um, that's nice because that comes as an oral, you know, basically it's an oral drink. It has like a citrus flavor and it's carbonated. So it's pretty palatable. It's kind of like a Sprite almost. Um, and then glycerin suppositories you more often see for like uh, infants typically because that'd be the alternative to like a, a fleet enema I'd probably use in an infant. Uh, the polyethylene glycol, we kind of talked about it in two different um, kind of modalities. There was sort of the uh, acute evacuation of the GI tract with uh, go lightly. So if you're like prepping for some sort of abdominal surgery or if they had a, a, a serious impaction they're being admitted for and they're getting the NG tube place to flush them out uh, or like a lithium ingestion or something, um, then you could use the go lightly. And that's like the big four, four liter uh, bottle they'd be drinking from. For typical routine use, though, you can get Miralax over the counter. That's usually like one one scoop a day or one cup cap full a day, which is like 17 grams. And they could do that every day. And so because that sort of acts as sort of like an osmotic, but a little bit like a bulk forming laxative, um, the diarrhea is not too, too frequent. However, you can always dial back the dose if they find that it's too much for the child, right? So, um, you know, some people will just go ahead and just mix a little bit in. And the nice thing, it's like tasteless and it is um, dissolves very well. So as opposed to something like a psyllium husk um, or like, like your metamucils and citrus cells, like that stuff is really grainy. Um, people, you know, they usually try to cover it up with like a you know, orange taste or something like that, but um, not as palatable. Miralax is, is much easier to deceive your child into taking by mixing it in to their, their drink or something. <clears throat> All right. What can be given to patients when receiving infliximab to prevent infusion-related reaction? You give methotrexate, a dalimumab, diphenhydramine, or epinephrine. And again, it's not just, oh, I know that drug can be used for this, but how we're using this is what we're trying to key in on, right? It's an important thing. Anyone can look in a book and see a list of drugs to use for something, but how we're using is important. And most of you got this correct. So that's fantastic. So, um, you know, those infusion reactions are fairly common, especially when you have those monoclonal antibodies um, that are chimeric like that. You can see the X on the name, which kind of clues you in. Um, so it's very frequent. So that, and, and again, what else could we give in, in conjunction with a diphenhydramine in order to prevent some of those reactions? Yeah, so uh, steroids, certainly. So dexamethasone could be used. I frequently see um, a methylpred, methylprednisolone being used much um, more commonly, at least where I work. Um, and because the patient's coming in to get the infusion anyway, so they probably have a port in place or they're getting an IV line started. So if you already got the IV, you can go ahead and just give methylprednisolone IV and that way it'll kind of kick in a little bit faster. So that's pretty common. And then yeah, acetaminophen would be the other big thing in order to treat any of like kind of like the fever and chills you may, you may get along with that. Um, H2 blockers, I haven't seen too, too frequently, too frequently, but that's a good thought as well because you're thinking about histamine-related reactions. I don't see a lot of gastrointestinal stuff, though, but you may find a patient or two that they may require that potentially. Um, in terms of epinephrine, when would we employ that drug? Yep, very good, anaphylaxis. So if you're infusing the drug and like the nurse calls you up, because maybe you're not there in the infusion center, maybe you're off doing seeing patients in clinic, nurse calls you up, say a patient's not feeling well, their blood pressure just dropped, you know, they're starting to complain of being really itchy and throat scratch or, you know, throat feels like it's getting a little tight, then that at that point, epinephrine is going to be your go-to. And hopefully you've already written orders that has uh, that available to them. So we normally will have like a PRN order, so a PRN anaphylaxis for epi. Uh, methotrexate, it may be used in conjunction with infliximab for certain rheumatologic conditions. Uh, maybe you'll see that with um, Crohn's or ulcerative sort of colitis. Um, what's kind of interesting is because of the immunosuppressive effects of methotrexate, some people feel that it actually helps to prevent your body from developing antibodies against the monoclonal antibody. So kind of like antibodies against antibodies against something else, right? So uh, basically that keeps the drug working uh, 
keeping it effective for longer, essentially. So you may see that combo occasionally. And then ADL Immunimab you'd use as an alternative to infliximab. So if the patient wanted to use something at home, they could inject themselves. That's perfectly reasonable. You would, would likely not use Remicade and Humira at the same time. That would be just way too much uh, immunosuppression there. I hope that makes, makes a sense. All right. Which medication route is least preferred during an acute seizure? You know, I don't like to ask negative questions on exams, but I can ask them here. This is a little more free form. So do intravascular, rectal, intramuscular, or oral? Very good, yeah. So why would we not want to do oral? Choking, aspiration, control, yep, absolutely. Good, so someone who's having active seizures, they're probably not gonna be protecting their airway super well, and they could have a chance that they could, um, yeah, I probably wouldn't wanna stick my finger uh, anywhere near their mouth as well, so that could be challenging. Um, so really any other routes, fine. So I think rectal was probably sort of like kind of the, you know, the, just the norm for a long time, especially on an outpatient basis with things like uh, diazepam rectal gel. But nowadays I'm seeing a lot more um, of our neurologists recommending intranasal for outpatient use. Um, so again, much less cumbersome. You don't have to get the patient undressed and it's just uh, a lot more uh, convenient from that standpoint. So that would be pretty often on the outpatient side of things. Once they get in contact with EMS or they're coming in in, in patient, like in the in the ER setting, um, really any of these could work. So like intravascular, intramuscular um, would be obviously the most common ones. Rectal, you're probably not going to mess with once they're you know in the hospital. Intravascular can be can be a challenge to get, especially if they're having tonic clonic seizures. Um, but occasionally you can hold them down. Potentially you can um, you know maybe you can get an IO in place if that's appropriate. Um, intramuscular is relatively easy though. So like just kind of jab them and, and you're done. Um, so yeah, so again, think about the routes of drug administration because that can be important. <clears> there <throat> some drugs sh should not be given via certain routes too. So like giving um, I am phenytoin would not be a good idea. It's just way too caustic to, to that tissue. Um, whereas um, you know I am midazolam or something would be reasonable. So and you, and you get a feel for that once you get into like rotations and whatnot. I don't know if those clowns are referring to me or to yourself, but I'll, I'll take it as uh, not offensive until proven otherwise. How about that? Um, all right, so which agent would allow for the fastest healing of a gastric ulcer? MAC hydroxide, lansoprazole, sucralfate, or cimetidine? Very good, yep. So PPIs are gonna always be the most potent in helping to heal with those. Um, now, if you couldn't use a PPI, you could still use an H2 blocker. It's just probably gonna take longer. You have to kind of work with maximal doses there. Obviously, you wouldn't recommend cimetidine most often because of drug interactions like we know. Um, and then stuff like caraphate and mag hydroxide would not really have a routine use in those situations. Um, you know, mag hydroxide, if you're using it by itself, it's usually for constipation. Um, for antacid purposes, it's almost always going to be in combo with, with uh, aluminum hydroxide. So you get that Maalox, Mylanta combo there. Um, and then sucralfate can be like an additional add-on, but it's not really going to be um, super effective at helping out with the healing there. So PPI is all the way, which I think most of you have a pretty good feel for. So again, uh, a lot of times the question will say, what's the most correct answer? Not what is a correct answer. And so that kind of helps us too. Make sure we're picking the, you know, something like, uh, so not to say you giving some meta to be completely incorrect, it's just probably not the best answer in this case, right? All right. All right, mesalamine enemas, Roasa, would be most likely to benefit which patients? Uh, constipated patient, GERD patients, ulcerative colitis patients, or Crohn's disease patients? Who would benefit from this? And kind of going back to knowing which drugs are used for what. Oh, wow. Even split here almost between uh, the constipated and the UC patient. So um, remember, uh, mesalamine is going to be an anti-inflammatory product, right? So it kind of gets converted into um, 5-ASA, and it's going to have anti-inflammatory properties for patients with um, uh 
you know, autoimmune conditions like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. Uh, but the dosage form matters here. So because it's an enema, it's not going to be good for Crohn's, which is going to be much more diffuse. Um, and then here for ulcerative colitis, really the enemas are going to be better for more like, you know, very distal end of the, the um, uh, colon, you know, the rectum, left-sided colitis. But if it's more diffuse than that, then the enema will not be the best choice for you there, right? Um, again, just because you see enema, don't automatically go to thinking constipation because that will... Uh, not always be the case there. But that's why I was trying to be a little tricky with that to see if you recognize the drug itself, what it's used for, and then how we're using it based on the dosage form, right? A little tricky, not too tricky. Kind of rooting for the brontosaurus because my kids are super into dinosaurs. I'm hoping, hoping you do well, brontosaurus. Or is it a brachiosaurus? Who knows? Uh, which of the following anti epileptics uh, work by facilitating increased GABA activity? Bifinitoin, phenobarbital, carbamazepine, or lamotrigine. Exactly. Who's not into dinos? We're actually um, we're gonna go in a week or two. There's some I can't remember if it's called Jurassic Quest or something like that, but it's like an outdoor, like dino, like a trip through Jurassic Park. I'm hoping the animatronics uh, do not, uh, like the AI doesn't go rampant and try to you know, eat us, but uh, hopefully it'll be cool for the kids. Now, we did go to one outdoor zoo place to have, um, it's like south southwest of uh, Orlando, and it was probably like a 30-minute drive to get there, but um, it was actually pretty cool. Basically, you're just kind of driving through, and like animals just come up to your window and give them lettuce and stuff. It's pretty neat. Um, anyway, so yeah, so looking at the activity of these drugs here, remember mechanisms are important, especially if you're looking at um, using multiple meds together. You want to make sure you're picking complementary mechanisms. So in the case here, actually all three of these that are the incorrect answer are sodium channel blockers, right? So they're blocking sodium channels in order to um, kind of decrease the hyperexcitability of those neurons. Whereas with phenobarb, if you recall, it kind of helps to uh, allow GABA to work better. In some cases, it can actually help to open up those GABA channels themselves to allow that chloride to flow in. Um, so this one would be working through GABA. If I had a patient who, for instance, um, you know, was already on phenytoin and I wanted to add something onto that regimen, I probably wouldn't pick another sodium channel blocker, right? I'd probably pick something complementary, like maybe a phenobarb. Um, so you wouldn't use like lamictal and dilantin together uh, because they're both kind of doing the same thing. And so if one's not working by itself, then adding more on that's uh, doing the same thing is probably not going to be the most effective use of, of your medications there. So that's why you want to use complementary stuff. You know, could you see someone who's on like phenytoin and valproic acid? Yeah, for sure, because that makes sense because they have different mechanisms uh, for the most part. Um, VPA and lamictal you'll see pretty commonly as well. So it really just depends on the provider and kind of what their experiences are and, and what's good for the patient there. All right, yes, dinos in the lee is pretty cool. And I, I don't want to play favorite, so it's good that I don't know who that is, but the dinosaur itself is cool. Uh, which of the following is true of renal function in neonates? Say the cockroft gallant's preferred formula to calculate function, prematurity increases function and quantity of the nephrons. Uh, the serum creatinine is falsely elevated in the first several days of life, or urine output is the least accurate uh, means of measuring function. Very good. Yeah. So why is the serum creatinine falsely elevated? The mom, yeah, the mom's creatinine is what you're typically measuring there. There's some equilibrium between her serum creatinine and the, uh, the fetus when it's still in the mom. And then when it's born, it will have that kind of lag time for it to clear that extra creatinine. Um, in terms of like how we calculate renal function in the neonates, there's not like a really good formula for that patient population specifically. Um, however, you want to make sure that when you're dealing with um, trying to estimate renal function for patients of various ages, you're using the correct formula. I didn't dive too much into this in the lecture, um, but for instance, like Cockroft gall is pretty good for adult patients. Like most adult patients you deal with, Cockroft gall is fine. Um, for kids, though, if you try to use that same equation, you're going to find it doesn't really match up one to one. So we do things like, for instance, with peds, we have something we call the Schwartz equation. And so um, we use the Schwartz equation, there's like a modified form we use, uh, and that gives us a better idea, right? Because again, how do these formulas get developed in the first place? Well, it's by doing studies, right? And so if the study never involved kids, then you can't say that it's going to be generalizable to that patient population. Cockroft gall, elderly patients, adult patients, that's fine. For peds, you got to do something different, right? 
um, you know, prematurity, everything is going to come out undercooked, basically, and that includes the kidneys, so that would not be the case there. Um, and then urine output is actually like the best way we can measure function, right? Um, how how do you measure urine output on like an infant, a newborn? Anyone know? Be the diaper, yeah. So either you have, uh, if they're catheterized, you can just measure it directly. That's always like the easiest means of doing it. Um, but for if they're in diapers, you can actually weigh it. So you compare the the dry weight versus the uh, you know the dry diaper versus the wet weight, um, and then you can uh, estimate the urine output via that way. Um, oftentimes with like teenagers and stuff, if they're not catheterized, they'll just like kind of pee into a little urinal, um, and then we always tell them like, please don't flush that. We need to measure it, and then they always flush it anyway because they're teenagers. They don't think about it or they don't really care. Um, so yeah, so make sure when you're measuring urine output that you can at least get a decent estimation. So we, we have trouble with this too in our cystic uh, fibrosis patients. So say for instance, they're on um, gentamicin for an infection because we know they always have uh, you know infection issues. Um, and so we're trying to estimate what their urine output is, but they don't measure uh, or they, they flush it too early or they forget or something like that. So what we end up having to do instead is sometimes trying to say, okay, well, how many times did they urinate today? And if it seems like a reasonable number, then we're just like, okay, well, that looks fine. And we compare it to the creatinine clearance. Okay, that looks fine. Then, you know, you kind of do the best you, you can. But at least for, for neonates and, and infants, it's relatively easy because they, they can't really do much about it anyway, right? All right. Next. Uh, which medication can be administered via endotracheal tube to, uh, to premature newborns with respiratory distress syndrome? Nubaractant, lumicaftor, ivacaftor, caffeine, or dexamethasone? That's very good. So remember, why do these premature newborns have respiratory distress syndrome? Besides the fact they're premature, what functionally is the problem? Not enough surfactant. Very good. So they lack surfactant. So the drug that looks like surfactant is going to be that replacement. So we give it into tracheally, and you can kind of shift them around. You can move the, the infant around in different positions, and that will allow um, to try to hit the different lobes of the lung there. So that's why I give it in kind of a few different aliquots. Um, so uh, that would be the case there. What do we use or calm before? Anyone know? Yep, very good. So CF, so for those patients, uh, it helps them to kind of get more of those CFTR channels. And remember, it's only for that one specific mutation, the Delta 5FO8 um, deletion. Um, so it helps them to get more channels up to the, uh, to the surface of the cell, so that way they can go ahead and try to transmit that chloride a little bit better. Um, caffeine, what do we use that for besides helping sleepy PA students barely maintain consciousness? Very good, yeah, so neonatal apnea would be the case there. And then dexamethasone, we know we can use it for a whole host of things, but how would I use dexamethasone in, uh, for uh, a patient who is at risk for respiratory distress syndrome? I don't know the best way to word that. Yeah, so you'd actually give it to mom, so that way it would stimulate, uh, help to stimulate production of surfactant early. All right, 48 hours before, yep, there you go. So kind of a prophylactic. Fantastic, you guys are so smart. Okay, which agent can be used as a prokinetic in a patient with gastroparesis? The isomeprazole, sodium bicarb, metoclopramide, or cannabis sativa? Speaking of which, I just learned, so if you guys are not familiar, um, the main psychoactive component of marijuana, as, as we talked about, is Delta-9 THC. I just learned about a Delta-8 THC, apparently, that is uh, some people are trying to utilize, and I guess it gives you like a little bit, um, it's kind of like a, a step down in terms of the psychoactive effects of Delta-9. Um, yeah, it's, it's not illegal yet. That's the question. Is it going to be... Who knows? I think a little, I mean, it's at least partially made in, in the plant itself. I think it's just in very low levels, at least what I was reading. Granted, it was, uh, I don't know, it was the most reputable site. It's hard to find good reputable information about some of that stuff. Yeah, from him. Yeah. So who knows? Maybe that'll be something we'll see more of. Um, anyway, so yeah, so if we're using it for prokinetic, that's what metoclopramide's um, mainly used for, or you may see it uh, more often for nausea vomiting. It really just depends. Um, he has a healthy curiosity. What is, what is the problem with that? I don't see any issues, right? 
Um, you should always be learning new things. Five times the same. Yeah, I was reading. It was it was pretty. Uh, it's like a kind of like a baby I as opposed to delta mi. It's kind of interesting stuff. Because again, like it's in in you know too. Um, it's always. Um, you know, it's funny, like at the, where I did that, my fellowship at the Poison Center, um, we always had to make sure that like, um, you know, it was based out of the hospital. And so we were on their internet servers. And so oftentimes we're getting flagged for going to these like websites like Arrowhead and, and different places like bluelight.ru. I don't even know if that's around anymore, but all these like really like heavy duty, like illicit substance websites. And they're like, what in the heck are you, what are you guys doing over there? And like, well, we have to do research. We have to find out about this stuff because our patients are doing it. So we want to learn about it. We're not doing it for our own, you know, our own purposes there. Anyway, um, yeah, so Reglan, nausea, vomiting, but also for prokinetic uh, purposes. That's where you see most use there. All right. We'll talk much more about cannabis when we get into the ortho pain man management section later on. Um, okay, which of the following meds would be the biggest risk for rash and Stevens-Johnson syndrome? I know what you're all thinking, but I did not put it on there. It was a 13-year-old with forbidden knowledge. Yes, that was a, a very interesting website. <clears throat> there's a really cool book um or a set of books that are written by this guy his name was um alexander shulgin i believe his name was he's like this researcher who basically like uh tried out all of these different like chemicals and documented like pretty heavily like all of his experiences with them and so he has a couple of books one's called um uh, pcal is phenylethylamines I have known and loved, and then TCAL, which is tryptamines I have known and loved. And it's really fascinating to watch his like documentation of all the different effects that he had uh, with varying doses of like ecstasy and DMT and all kinds of stuff. Uh, but it's, it's pretty, pretty wild uh, to see. Anyway, yeah, so uh, I'm sure most of you are probably thinking uh, Lamictal, Stevens Johnson's. Yeah, that's like classic to uh, pairing there, but it can happen with other drugs too, right? So things like carbamazepine, phenytoin do carry that risk, which is why it's good to be vigilant, um, especially if you have a patient who's presenting with what you think might be Stevens Johnson's and there are multiple medications, you do want to screen for all of them, not just the ones that look like the smoking gun, basically, right? All right. Up next, what would I worry about with, um, actually, I'll ask, in just a, actually, wait, I can stop right here. So uh, what would I worry about with um, Keppra? Is there anything particularly unique to Keppra? Suicide risk. Yeah, it's so like mood stuff, mood changes, um, more so in pediatrics is what they've seen. Yeah, obviously like increased aggression being mentioned there. So um, certainly something um, good board style question too, right? I may not always see it clinically, but it's good to know about. All right. Uh, in pediatrics, which of the following means of drug dosing is least sensitive to the extremes in weight? Would it be weight-based, body surface area, height-based, or age-based dosing? Very good. So body surface area, why is that least sensitive to extremes in weight? Remember, density uh, accounts for height and weight. Very good. That's a perfect answer. So it's taking into account height and weight when figuring that out. So if you have, you know, a teenager who's uh, 100 kilos and they're six foot two versus one that's five foot three that could be very different in terms of body surface area and so if you're just dosing off of, of body weight that can be um, that can run into some issues right obviously the person's much taller likely to be leaner than the person who's, who's shorter with the same weight um, so you can get into some issues uh, of weight-based dosing like that um, with with obese patients so body surface area you factors in um, height and weight which is, is important there Keep in mind, getting an accurate height and weight may not always be possible, especially if you're dealing like emergent situations. Maybe you don't have time to weigh that person before you need to give them something like epi because they're in cardiac arrest. So oftentimes you may be dealing with like old information from the parents, right? Um, height base can be a challenge. Keeping a child to stand still long enough to get an accurate height can be difficult. There are medical conditions that will lead to things like, you know, contractures, which would be make it difficult to get accurate height. So it's not perfect, but uh, try to make sure that you're at least getting as accurate information as you can. 
obviously age base doesn't take into account any of those features and so it's very much just saying okay well if you're between three and six this is the dose you get and that may not always be appropriate based on the size of the kid um you know whether very large or very small right so that's why i always want to double check on that stuff fantastic great Uh, which of the following drugs can be used as a mucolytic in a CF patient? 3% saline nebulization, tobramycin, Dornase alpha, or azithromycin? Um, I don't know why I didn't put this as two right answers. Oh my goodness, I totally screwed up all the, the scoring now. You guys are going to break me over the coals of my evals now because I screwed up this Kahoot. But actually, there should be two right answers. I forgot to click off the other one. But yeah, there's actually 3% uh, saline nebulization and Dornay's Alpha. You may even see like 7% saline used occasionally. Um, so I apologize to the 20 of you. I'll, I'll give you a million bonus points um, to, for, for recompense. Um, anyway, so uh, those can be used as mucolytics. It'll help to then uh, kind of increase the um, or the fluidity or decrease viscosity of the mucus, so it's a little bit easier to clear when you do things like your chest physiotherapy and things like that. Um, what am I using tobramycin for? Oh, the dinos out? Oh, no. That was the mass extinction event that killed off the dinosaur, apparently. Good, we're using it to treat the infections, right? So um, we are uh, basically trying to get at all of that colonized bacteria that are in the lungs there. So if you were, say for instance, like a patient was getting albuterol, they're getting um, Dornase Alpha, they're getting Tobramycin, like which one of those do you think you'd want to give last? Think about the order that you're giving those medications. Or So why would you do the Tobra last? What do you think? Good. So open everything up as much as you can. Clear out the lungs, open it up. So if you wanted to do something like maybe give a mucolytic, do the chest physiotherapy so that way they try to expectorate all of that gunk and then give them something like the albuterol to try to open things up a bit more, that will allow the Toby to penetrate that much deeper. Um, so that will try to get as good a concentration as you can in the lungs. It's the benefit of using inhaled tobramycin is you get very high concentrations there right where you need it and you don't really see a whole lot of systemic penetration um so you don't have to worry about like you know neurotoxicity and, or um ototoxicity and things like that with with the uh, aminoglycoside so just something to consider why would i use azithromycin in these patients what kind of infection am i treating idea well remember they're not taking it um for any infection in particular right remember these are patients taking azithromycin chronically uh you may see like a monday wednesday friday sort of schedule they'll be on um and so that is for inflammation there's some anti-inflammatory properties uh, it's also why you see some patients with covid will actually be treated with azithromycin they're just trying something i don't know if there's a whole lot of evidence behind it but um yeah it, it could have some motility effects but that's not really the issue for these cf patients um so the azithromycin, because think about it, their lungs are chronically inflamed. They got all this like infections going on that are just colonized. Um, chronically inflamed, it can lead to damage of the lungs over time. Um, and so that's why we do the azithromycin, right? Now, do I know there's any like survival data that says that they do that much better? Not really sure, but it's pretty standard of care uh, for them to get that chronic azithromycin. Like I said, usually Monday, Wednesday, Friday sort of schedule. So again, kind of a trick question to say, what infection are you treating? It's really kind of all of them um, and none of them at the same time, so to speak. All right. All right. Uh, prior to starting treatment with alentuzumab or Lemtrada, MS patients should be tested for Lyme disease, tuberculosis, influenza A and B, or strep pneumo. I can't tell if you guys are just like kind of extra sleepy or just over thrilled with uh, doing pharmacology. I can't tell. It's difficult. Um, yeah, so a lot of these um, monoclonal antibodies, these immunosuppressive agents are going to, um, you want to test for TB beforehand just to make sure a patient doesn't have a latent infection that could activate when 
giving the drug. Um, so you'll see that a lot, and especially when you talk about um, like Remicade and things like that when we get into rheumatology next. Um, none of these other ones you routinely need to test for, so that uh, would not be the case there. Um, someone said, for CF patients, would you give them tobramycin chronically or just when they have an infection? Um, so for CF patients, again, when you initiate uh, first, um, maybe dependent on the patient or the provider, but um, what you're going to find is um, that they will frequently be on it chronically, but they'll be on sort of a cyclical schedule, mainly because you don't necessarily want to have that sort of pressure on the bacteria all the time because you may find resistance can be a bit of an issue. So you'll find frequently they'll do it for like 28 days on and then 28 days off. And they'll kind of do that cycle back and forth um, to uh, kind of help clear out some of that colonized bacteria and then kind of give the patient a break and then put them back on it and off again. So you'll see that pretty frequently. If they're having an acute exacerbation, then you go ahead and treat them regardless. And it's uh, pretty frequent that you'll see um, something like, think how often I see this, but, um, you know, if you think about having one of these CF patients come in, they're having an exacerbation, you got to treat empirically, um, you know, so they may be on Vanco, Leviquin, um, and inhaled Toby, for instance, right? Um, so that way that could be your three drug regimen, two different drugs to treat Pseudomonas, one to cover for MRSA, right? But again, make sure you're checking these patients, their profiles out before you start prescribing. Because if you have back, if you have information, historical information that says they're typically resistant to X, Y, and Z drug, then you don't want to use it because you're just kind of wasting time and the patient may decompensate further um, by delaying appropriate care. So just something to consider there. All right. Which agent would not be used in the treatment of H. pylori infection? What do we think? We not use amoxicillin, bismuth, meprazole, or algenic acid. Be pretty straightforward. I don't know if H. actually looks like that or not, but they kind of look like the aliens off of um, Arrival to me. All right, remember that um, your three drug regimens typically include uh, two antibiotics and usually some sort of acid suppressor, but a lot of the four drug regimens, that fourth drug is bismuth subsilicely, that Pepto-Bismol we're adding on there. So that would certainly be um, something we would use for the treatment of H. pylori. Remember, not only does it kind of help out with sort of coating the stomach, kind of help soothing it, but it also does have some anti infective properties in and of itself. It doesn't really like the aspirin there. Um, uh, bismuth can have some activity ad additionally, so that, that is useful. Algenic acid or Gaviscon, you'll see this in some over-the-counter preparations, but honestly, it's like pretty mild in terms of its activity. So it really doesn't have a place in treating H. pylori, so that's something um, that you would not use too, too frequently or it would not get a whole lot of utility out of. Last question here. Who would be contraindicated from receiving frovatriptan? They have psoriasis. They use an ergot last week. They have a history of ischemic stroke or hypertension controlled just with HCTZ. Right, so think about the time frames for when you can use these drugs together, right? So what's the time frame that you don't want to use an ergot and a triptan together? Any ideas? Any guesses? 24 hours, yes, definitely. So 24 hours, if it's within that time frame that I would not use the two, um, or I would not use the forever triptan for that patient. If it was last week, I don't really care because that drug is out of the system by then. It won't really make a difference. Um, psoriasis is not there's kind of a red herring there. And, and the trick with the hypertension, if it was not currently controlled and it was fairly elevated, I probably wouldn't want to use it either. So that's going to be a relative contraindication. If it's being treated with, with meds and their blood pressure is under control, yeah, you can get away with that. So you'd still monitor the blood pressure, especially if it's like the first time they're taking it. Um, but that would be something uh, that would not necessarily preclude you from using it. The history of ischemic stroke, though, right? Remember, what do these drugs do? Like, How does frovastriptan work?
vasoconstriction, right? So if they have a history of ischemic stroke, presumably they have some degree of uh, maybe stenosis or some blockage. And so if you cause vasoconstriction around that area, you can induce that again. So like history of MI, um, uh, ischemic, you know, stroke, uh, you know, mesenteric ischemia, anything like that, any history of that, I would be very cautious of using um, a triptan and certainly any ergot amines. Um, what's the additional contraindication that ergots have that triptans don't? Who do I not want to use an ergot in? Pregnancy, yes, very good. So pregnant patients, ergots are category X, do not use them. Imagine closing off all those little vessels in that little fetus, not going to be good for them. Um, uh, all the triptans end up falling into category C, which we'll talk about as kind of like the junk drawer of pregnancy categories. Everything kind of falls into that. We don't really know if it's harmful or helpful. Um, so we just kind of leave it in that categorization. We'll see there's the pregnancy categories are kind of fraught in terms of their utility. Um, and we'll get talk about that extensively when we get into ob guy coming up next. So, or when we get to it. Anyway, so, man, it's weird to see 2021 on there. Sure. Hi, well, hello to you as well. Uh, who's high? Who's number three? Anyone? Remaining anonymous. You have, oh no. It's like, hi, no, no. It's like, uh, like your toddler's like first words. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, and then who's the dinosaur? Oh, good job, Caitlin. All right, Isabel, fantastic. Um, all right, so that does it for our Kahoot. So that's kind of the review. Um, your answer, your free answer. Well, I can't tell you. I got to tell Isabel. I'll privately... Send her that B is the, the free answer. All right. Anyway, so um, any questions from you guys at all? We've won four now. It's pretty good. It's awesome. But remember, this does not necessarily indicate how you'll do on the test. So, you know, don't get discouraged. You've got plenty of time. Prize for last place. You get um, my condolences. Should we word for the next exam? Do you talk about like the, the one on Monday or the following one? One with room at no. Well, I'll I'll shift it around, so I'm not gonna like try to uh, combine everything together. So I wouldn't be too scared about that. I might just have to um, shift some stuff around. So we'll we'll have plenty of time to get through everything, and I'll make sure the tests are you know adequately weighted for what we cover. Um, yeah, so no worries about that. Um, and like I said, you know, there's a bunch of new questions on this one that, that I came up with. So, um, just so you know, uh, when I do new questions like that, sometimes there's like, they're bad questions. I didn't realize until you guys actually like, we put it into practice. So I always look at those with kind of an extra, um, uh, take it with a grain of salt. If you guys like, you know, if you just totally bomb that question, it could be because it's a bad question. So I always try to look at those to make sure um, that they're not, you know, performing poorly and they might be, you know, considered for, for give backs and stuff. Because either I worded something weird or I didn't teach something appropriately or uh, effectively or whatever the case may be. So um, just so you know, I always, I always take a look at that stuff to make sure you guys are getting a fair shake for all of that. Um, anyway, so any, any other questions I can answer for you all? Okay, Paige, uh, I'm not sure it's your fault at all, but just a general question, why have a farm exam on a Friday? I don't know what happened to the schedule there. Actually, I, I keep forgetting to ask Professor Lack about that, but I think one of the tests is on Friday, correct? Just one of them? I, I don't know what happened to that schedule. That's We always know to put it on, on the Monday. You think April Fool's? I don't know. They're fooling me too, if that's the case. Um, I would, uh, you know, if... Boy, you guys are really... To be fair, it used to be random. It used to be Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. So, um, because that's only been uh, relatively recent in the past three, three, four years or so, we've done that. Um, if you all have grave concerns about this test, um, then I would recommend uh, maybe talking to your class president to bring up your concerns with Professor Lack, and maybe something will happen. I don't really get to set the schedule, so yeah, up all night. I, I apologize for that. Um, so the next test, let me, um, I haven't posted it yet, but next section will start with the rheumatology. Um, let me find. And if you're, if you guys don't want to stick around, that's fine. I'm just kind of answering questions and stuff. So if you guys want to bounce, that's totally fine with me. Um, so we'll do room, we'll do ortho, which is like more focused on pain management and kind of ancillary stuff. We'll have behavioral. OB gyne and then I'd set for endocrinology, but that might get pushed to the next test as well. So it might be room, ortho, behavioral, and OB gyne I'm trying to mimic kind of the order of the test that you're taking, but it's again I can only do that with so much ability. So 
Oh, good. All right, Alyssa's already going to be talking about it, so that's that's good. I, honestly, I don't care when the test is, so it's more of a, a scheduling issue, so that we may not be able to move it, but if we can, then I, I don't care. You have my blessing. Okay, well, 